Welcome all to a special extra uh, talk brought to you by CPRE, the Countryside Charity. In a moment, we'll hear about the art and crafts of hedge laying for Nigel Adams, Adams, who has worked in the countryside management for many, many years. Uh, throughout his career, Nigel has been an active hedge layer, competing at local and national championships for over 35 years. He sits on the steering group for Hedgelink. Uh, he's been involved in hedgerow research projects and gives many presentations and training days throughout this country and wider Europe on hedgerow management. Uh, before we do go into uh, Nigel's talk, uh, I'd like to point you to our website, cpreshropshire.org.uk, where you can find a host of valuable resource on hedgerows and how and why we should be protecting them. As part of its hedgerow project, CPRE Shropshire has run five hedge laying workshop workshops this winter uh, with an extra two booked for January. They've been incredibly popular. Um, we will have trained around 80 people by the end of this year's project from teenagers to older, elder adults. There are also more details about our upcoming talks, walks and workshops, as well as past recordings of the talks that we've already had. There are three more talks in this um, present series still available to book from February onwards, covering hedges, trees, the planning system, the field names of Shropshire and woodland and biodiversity. Uh, we are still seeking people to help us plant new hedges after Christmas. Check out the hedge planting page on our website and you can book onto the dates you want via the online form. Or you can email Sarah Jameson, who's our branch manager, at, at uh, admin at cpreshropshire.org.uk. At CPRE, and I'm talking about the whole of CPRE, and I see a few CPRE faces here tonight. We are passionate about hedgerows, amongst other things um, that we do to protect our countryside. After all, CPRE at its inception was at the heart of some of the first planning and hedgerow legislation that um, controls most of our planning regulations today. So after today, if you're thinking about what you can do to support our aims, please visit cpre.org.uk forward slash get involved. And now I have the pleasure of handing over to Nigel Adams. Nigel. Thank you very, very much indeed. And thank you all for attending tonight's talk. I'll just say a little bit about myself and then in a, in a wee minute I get Connor to, I think he's in control of the slides, which makes life easier for me. So I'm Nigel Adams and I'm speaking to you from the Chiltern Hills in South Oxfordshire, where I grew up, although my father was from Shropshire, as I think I mentioned earlier on to some folk who were listening. Uh, so that's a special place to me. Um, I live in South Oxfordshire. I've in, my, in the past worked for uh, Natural England and the National Trust as wardens in various places. And the last proper job I had was as head warden for Dartmoor for the National Trust, um, which was a beautiful place, but all that work and being stuck to an office desk wasn't for me. So I gave that up and returned to Oxfordshire. And now I do a whole range of what I call countryside management tasks. I own 150 sheep, which I graze on chalk grassland site, um, do an awful lot of uh, hedgerow work, planting and flat out hedge laying this winter right the way through. Um, I do a lot of talks like these and also management plans for farmers around the country, farms and estates, where we look at the management, where I'm a very great believer in uh, the fact that we need to manage our hedgerows in the correct way. But tonight's talk is about hedge laying. And I have to say, it's, it's been fascinating for me. Um, I've done loads of talks all over the place, but never one specifically on hedge laying, which is my passion. So it's, I quite enjoyed the, uh, the little bit of research just to, to get some interesting facts and figures for you. So um, I don't know if we could have the slides up, we we'll dive straight in. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, look, it works, except I've got a strange box in the middle of my screen. So I'm going to try and drag it away. Look at that. Wow, I'm impressed with myself. <laughs> so yes, I've, I've, this is not necessarily the title uh, how it was advertised, um, but I've just called this hedge lane past, present and future. And in the background there, you can see a picture of some hedge laying, some Midland hedge laying. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. If I could have the next slide, please. There we go. So I just want to talk a very, very briefly about hedgerows in general. We have in the UK 547,000 kilometres of hedge, give or take a metre or two. 
Um, and I think they define our landscape. You know, whenever you fly into our country or visitors do, there's nothing like that landscape uh, of, of hedged fields. Um, probably the densest, densest uh, population of hedgerows in the whole of Europe, along with Ireland, um, the UK and Ireland. They do have hedges in Europe, but, but the tradition of managing them has, has sort of been lost, though I have to say they're regain, regaining an interest, but they give us so much hedges. And in many ways, we just think hedges are just there. We flail them every year and they'll look after themselves. And I don't want to delve into my management talk too much, but we really do need to manage hedges. Uh, hedge left alone wants to become a line of trees. Nature wants to take it back to being a forest in a sense. And our hedgerows are, in a sense, woodland edges. They are all those species of shrubby stuff that would appear on a woodland edge. And so we need to manage our hedges. They give us so much, so many ecosystem services from stopping soil erosion to sequestrating carbon, um, special uh, habitats for rare species. The list goes on and on and on. And uh, we really do have to look after them. But why are they there? Well, I suppose the two main reasons they were there were, were to mark ownership. Um, very easy to make, um, you know, put posts in the ground, which can be stolen over the, overnight. I'm going back hundreds and hundreds of years here. So by planting a hedge, you're making a real statement. This is my field. This is my boundary. And uh, the second and perhaps the more relevant reason for hedgerows, which we're going to be talking about tonight, is the idea of hedges keeping animals in or indeed out of fields. And as agriculture developed, that became a very big function. And in order to make a hedge stock proof, as we will look at in a minute, that involved laying. So hedge laying took place all over the UK pretty well, apart from say Northern Scotland, where there simply aren't that many hedges. And of course, areas where stone walls became that field boundary. Um, hedgerows were laid. There was always one or two farmers on a farm. And of course there were way more staff on farm in those days whose winter work was hedge laying and ditching. But let's go back in history and let's look, have a look at the next slide and start to just talk about the idea of where hedges came from. That's our countryside, you know, that's ancient species rich countryside, possibly Shropshire like in some parts, Wales, Devon, parts of the Chiltern, Sussex, that ancient species rich hedge, uh, uh, hedges and field systems. They're like, the, it's like the stitching in the patchwork quilt there, isn't it? And the next slide, please. That's the ancient species rich hedges. Um, the other type of hedge, by the way, is, is, the, is the enclosure hedges, which will come on, which are very different than that, very straight and very organized. But let's just, this is a strange picture perhaps, but this is a picture I took in Tanzania some years ago of a dead hedge. And perhaps if we delve right back into the depths of history, I mean, we've no idea essentially where hedges came from, but something like this, I think is a pretty good guess. So in Tanzania, somebody goes off every day and walks with the cattle or the goats or the sheep and then comes back of an evening and puts them in a safe compound. And that would have been exactly the same in, in ancient times in Great Britain. The idea of walking with sheep up, up onto common land or through woods, no fields then really, and coming back to this safe stockade. That's a dead hedge. That is stuff cut off branches of trees and made into a dense hedge, um, but not living. But you can imagine birds landing in that and passing seeds down through into the into the ground and hedges starting to grow and form. And then those hedges, those plants be, being manipulated, for want of a better bird, word, either either chopped or bent over or woven together to form that denser kind of uh, structure. And so I, I, I'd like to think that the dead hedges uh, were the forebears of, of all our hedgerows in many ways. Thank you. First, uh, first and only bit of writing in my talk, I hate to read things off the screen, but it's just worth, I've just found some things which help us to get a sense of time, really, and I'll, and I'll read them out. I, whilst I was researching, you know, a survey of Stonehenge, um, you know, more sort of LIDAR kind of uh, survey of uh, Stonehenge, found these, extra, these banks they didn't know were there. Um, two encircling banks, which they're pretty sure had hedges on. And then the concept was that it, it kind of... Um, well, they actually call it stone hedge, which are quite light. Um, the idea that everything within the Stonehenge uh, area was made more secret by a hedge being around. So it was a voyage of discovery as one went in. So that's, you know, about 3,600 years ago, the concept of a hedge was there. The reeve system, that system that you see on Dartmoor, these, these almost invisible now, um, unless it's like a frosty day where you can see them, these banks that cross Dartmoor, amazing things. Between 1700 and 1300 BC, 
they were field boundaries. They may or may not have had hedges on them, but there was this idea of boundaries, the boundary of your property or your domain. In 1200 BC, Homer describes this thing called an abetis, which is not necessarily just a hedge. It's kind of a large bank with um, these deep hedges, you know, maybe 10 meters deep, which surrounded Greek military forts, and Homer describes those. Julius Caesar in 57 BC in the book Di Bello Gallico wrote of the, how the Nervi tribe in Flanders, and this is a, a translation of it, notched young trees and bent them over towards my cavalry and had planted bramble and thorny wood growth so it could not be penetrated. So just a little hints there of something vaguely akin to hedge laying the idea in a defensive manner, chopping through trees and laying them towards an attacker. Columella, who was a uh, Roman uh, writer on agriculture, actually wrote this book, De Rustica, and he wrote this little interesting thing. I will show you a way to fence a garden at a small expense so as to defend it both from men and cattle. And he refers to the fact that the most ancient writers prefer a live hedge to a built fence. And he goes on to describe weaving things in and out, and bramble and everything. That idea of forming a living fence. The Saxon charters, uh, uh, Saxon charters describe often the right someone might have to enter a wood and collect hedge. Now that is definitely referring to a dead hedge. You're going into the forest to collect branches, to collect, I think they call it troth, uh, to come back and make your dead hedge with or block up gaps in hedge. But the idea of hedges are starting to evolve. The Saxons were quite uh, big on their hedges, shall I say. And I'm going to come back to this next gentleman, Anthony Fitzherbert, who in 1523, it happened to be the first ever book on agriculture that was ever um, produced. The Book of Husbandry was, was actually spelt Boke of Husbandry. It's not a spelling mistake. I want to come back to him, but he absolutely describes pretty well what we know of as hedge laying today. Thank you. This is a, actually a picture of a quite crudely um, laid hedge in the foreground, but this is in Cambridgeshire. It's known as Judith's Hedge, and it was uh, probably the earliest hedge that was fully described uh, in 1086 because it was given to this lady, Judith, who I think was William the, William the Conqueror's niece. And she was given some land and it was described exactly where this hedge is. It's at Monkswood in uh, Cambridgeshire. As a side story, those hedges in the background there, this was part of the Monkswood Research Station, and they actually filled a field full of hedges, so strips of hedges, and they did an awful lot of research on hedges. That's neither here nor there, but that is a little bit, happened to have been laid of Judas Hedge in 1086, okay? This is back to, to Anthony Fitzherbert. He wrote a book, The Book of Husbandry, and here this chapter is called To Plash, or To Plesh, same word, a hedge. No, Plash, Plesh, comes from the word, the French word plessage, the uh, Latin word plexus, and that meant to braid, to weave. Um, actually, interestingly, it, it is involved in the word complex. When we think of the word complex, that word plex, that part of it refers back to plex, as in pleach or plesh. So it's that idea of complex, and if you think about it in hedgerow terms, you're making the hedge more complex by manipulating it into this barrier, quite interesting. And it's fascinating to look back on, um, I, I recently had a French lecture translated for me by a French anthropologist who was talking about the origin of words and especially hedgerows, how way back in time, there was a lot of myths involved in hedgerows. Um, the hedgerow was a, in those days, considered a feminine entity. And there was this person, this feminine character called Haga Azusa, hag being hag, I won't say the word hag yet, that's interesting, the slip of the tongue. Hag is the German word and the Dutch word for hedge, but there was this person called Haga Zusa, it comes from the word Zeus, and she was the goddess of the hedge. Um, but when the Christians came and tried to take over these rather pagan ideas, they made this hag Zusa, the, the goddess, they made that into a negative thing by turning it into the word hag and witches. Um, and it was said by this person in the 14th century writing that um, it's, it's easier to burn a witch than a goddess. So this, this feminine entity of, of the hedge was turned by the, by the early Christians into this, this hag, this witch. Just a useless bit of information, but I was fascinated by it the other day. So here's this guy in 1523, to plash or pleach a hedge. He's describing hedge laying, and I'll just read the first few lines if I may. If the hedge be of 10 or 12 years growing since it was first set, 
Then take a sharp hatchet or handbill and cut the sets in a plain place, nigh unto the earth, and more half asunder, more than halfway through, and bend it down towards the earth and wrap and wind them together. But always see that the top lie higher than the root a good quantity, for else the sap will not rain into the top. Now that is absolutely describing what we know as um, hedge laying in 1523. So we must presume it had been around for centuries before, before then. That's the first ever book written on agriculture. Thank you. And this is the sort of thing I think he was describing. This is a picture taking in France where they actually do this rather more crude style as we would know it of hedge laying. But you can see here, hopefully you can see my cursor. There are every meter or so live um, posts. They leave some tall and then they cut in and bend it between. And I think that's the sort of thing that he was describing in 5023 rather than our more, shall I say, technical styles that we do today, okay? This was a book written in 1804 by Arthur Young. Arthur Young wrote a whole series of surveys of all the counties around the country, fascinating really. Uh, and the one on Hertfordshire, and Hertfordshire is not necessarily known as a hedge lane capital of the world, but this was on Hertfordshire in 1804. And again, he's describing, there's lots of diagrams, lots of precise description of hedge lane. And the little diagram at the bottom, this is the cut that we make, we call that the preacher. And um, you know, there he is describing exactly that in 1804. Thank you very much. And another diagram from that book, which shows a rather uh, naive form of a bank there with a, I don't quite know why he represents it like that, but there we are. That's essentially hedge laying as we know it with things being cut at the base. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute and laid over to form that barrier. Thank you. And this is a picture I guess taken whenever late 40s or, or early 50s of a gentleman just having uh, laid that hedge, dug the ditch up, that was always done at the same time. Um, and here we are, we've evolved now in that little talk about the history, we've evolved into something which is rather more, uh, root, um, yeah, not routine, but formal, shall I say, uh, that was encouraged and started to, to develop in its, in its skill level, I suppose. Thank you. Back to Europe and back to that early kind of hedge lane, which I think you know was was done. This is this is um, uh, something in Belgium. This is called the Plaque Hedge, P L A G. Um, they leave live stems. They're cutting in at the base of some of these stems, but they leave some live vertical posts. And can you see they're tying? Hopefully, you can see my cursor. They're tying the the branches to the posts with these little thin pieces of willow, which they twist in this incredibly uh, skillful way and tie them to the posts. Okay. And there you can see a close up of this very, very complex and incredibly skilled thing, tight as anything, lasts two or three years, just holds the individual stems. And perhaps we were using something like that here in, in medieval times and before here. Thank you. So this is, a, I'm just flitting around what was done traditionally across Europe as well. This is called a cross hedge. Uh, again, uh, sort of northern Belgium, right up into Germany. One of the agric British agricultural writers in 1770 describes going through north Germany and seeing these cross hedges made of hornbeam. And he, he says there were mile upon mile upon them. So they, from a young age, they're actually trained to go in this cross style. OK. And here's a close up picture of how something they often used hornbeam, beech, lime, things like that. And in crossing them and tying them together, they grew together. That's all bonded together. So it was a very, very solid thing. In Belgium, they particularly did it around church yards, actually, strangely enough. OK. I'm just giving you a bit of background there of those more older sort of styles. But here we are today. We've now developed into something which has become highly sort of skilled and formal. We have many, many local styles that have developed, which I'll talk about further, but that's, I'm not going to talk in too much detail at this slide, but that, that's the typical, that's where we're at today with, and that's a Midland hedge. Okay, thank you. Touching on history again, you can still see many old signs of hedgerows in our hedgerows, especially in the winter when you can see right into the bottom of them. This is a fascinating thing, probably been laid two or three times, laid in both directions there. It's a bit of hawthorn. And you can see just the scar there of that preacher, that cut is starting, well, healed over considerably, but there's a real history going on in that, that profile there. And you can see them all over the place. Thank you. 
here again this is a piece of hawthorn which would have been more at about 40 degrees diagonally there but has dropped down slightly but all the vertical growth that's coming up off that old pleacher um could be laid should we ever want to, to lay that again thank you Uh, woodland banks are an interesting thing here in the Chiltern Hills. We have lots and lots of old woodland banks around coppice areas, for example, and, and often hornbeam would, were used. And these are really ancient things, always hornbeam. I don't know why. Um, amazing. I've seen these on Exmoor, Dartmoor, all over the place and just really, really ancient. That has had lots of management to make it for, grow in this rather strange way. You can see a bit of a, a bank. It's on there. Fascinating history. OK. Here's a, a bit of ash you can see. Um, again, complex what's been going on, but that definitely was a pleacher. And here you see the vertical growth going off it. And actually, you see this dead end here. I can't make out whether that dead thing is on the ground. I think that's on the ground. But nevertheless, that pleacher would have run on maybe another 10, 12 feet even. But because these verticals took the growth, you know, became the, the dominant growth, that end just closes off, dies off, and you get this stump. But that would have been longer uh, when it was first laid. Thank you. So here we are, modern day hedge laying. There are lots of styles. We'll look at those in a minute. But the technique of cutting is the same in every one of those styles, which is to start at one end of the hedge, obviously, and then take in each individual stem sequentially as you move along and cutting close down to the base. Now, the, the, the greater the diameter of the stem, the higher you start the cut roughly three or four times the diameter of the stem. That's how high you start. So, you know, a stem of only one inch, you don't start very high, but as they get wider, you start higher. And we diagonally come down through the stem, but leaving just enough there, it's such a small amount that it often does surprise people. But that is enough wood there to have the cambium layer underneath, which will take the sap up and down into that stem that those are all alive. Now, this section here, uh, in fact, if I point over here, there's a noggin of wood there. Can you see that chunk of wood that that would have been stood up there? Because when I cut down, I'm left with what's called a heel on. And those those heels are taken off as low to the ground as possible. All the new growth will come from around the base of the stem, stump there. And should that hedge be laid again in 20, 30, whatever years, then the next person can also lay close to the ground so that lambs, etc., can't get through. And that cutting style is the same for every style. Thank you. And there's another just close up of showing just how relatively little we leave, but we always take the heels off. Two reasons, not only to get the new growth to be low down, but if we didn't take that heel off, then that wouldn't be able to sit down on there, would it? It would be sitting on top of that, the heel. Thank you. Tools of the trade. Um, Billocks, these are a couple of mine. Um, there are loads and loads of types, as I'll show in the next slides, but basically we have that for the for the for the pleaching the cutting and also trimming up the top one is a double-sided uh, tool that's a yorkshire billhook and down here we've got a single-sided one i think that's i can't quite recall the style of that one there are so many but that's one of my favorite uh, and both uh, favorite billhooks and these are both obviously really really sharp because uh, when you're using them all the time sharp is the is the, the way to go as it were thank you and again, just showing the bottom of the hedge, uh, we use we use axes a lot. That's a Kent axe. It has to be said, and you know, I'll own up straight away that we actually use chainsaws quite a lot these days because when we're commercially hedge laying, time is of the essence. We get paid by the meter, so the chainsaw comes in handy. My father always said to me when I started, "Well, we didn't have chainsaws in my day," but I did point out to him that I bet he wishes he did. <laughs> okay, thank you. So it's just a, a collection of tools here. Um, this, this is taken from a book by a gentleman called Georg Muller, who was a very dear friend, no longer with us, who spent 27 years of his life traveling all over Europe, recording every single hedge bank, hedge, uh, stone wall, everything, uh, just magnificent um, books. Um, they are they're available for, for a couple of hundred quid, but it's like the Bible of, of hedges, really. But the, this show all the many patterns of hedgerows, uh, sorry, of bill hooks and the things down the bottom here for driving the stakes in the beetles or mouths, as we call them. Thank you for the next slide. And this is just a few of the different styles, different styles, just like the styles of hedge laying, which develop locally 
and stayed locally because people didn't really travel that much, did they? They also had their favourite kind of pattern of billhook made by local blacksmiths. Uh, as we move through time, the local blacksmiths started to sell out to larger companies and then those larger companies made got sold out to people like, eventually people like Bulldog. You may have heard of Bulldog tools. Absolute rubbish these days, I have to say. But uh, these old, old steel uh, tools were absolutely fantastic and, and it's fascinating to know the locality of them all. Thank you. And on each of these old tools, um, very often on the bit hooks, you get a stamp. And this this company was was called Hedgehog, and in, the, in the, their beautiful uh, steel in those tools, and it's the, the little motif of a of a hedgehog there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one other thing we use uh, are these thick leather hedge laying gloves. I have to say we tend not to use them too much these days. We we live in a throwaway society, and we use these welders gloves, which cost about five pound each and last for about uh, two months and then throw them away and get a new pair. But these are the old hedge laying gloves that were used, you know, cattle hide or even pig hide actually, absolutely impenetrable because of course we are working with thorns an awful lot of the time and they can go right through most gloves. But those were the old type of hedge laying gloves that we used, thank you. So let's get on to how the hedge laying. So, as you can see from that picture, we, we've started up on the uphill end there, up towards the left. We always lay uphill as a, as a general principle, unless it's, unless it's not much of a slope. The logic being that if you lay downhill, um, the sap, in a sense, wouldn't get drawn up to the top of the plant. And you, if you recall the um, quote from the 1523 book, where he said, make sure the top lay higher than the, bite, the base or the sap will not rain into it. <laughs> so they knew that back in 1523. We tend to start at the top and lay uphill. It also actually looks better. It flows better going uphill. So we move downwards there and each stem we are taking one at a time. And um, actually uh, it's fascinating really because I mean, every stem is different. There's always a problem with every single stem. You have, it's a problem solving every time you go onto a new stem. Thank you. So just a few pictures here, just showing a process, really. I've started a hedge just there. Um, as I approach the next stem, what I would do is, is look up into the top to make sure that next stem is free at the top before I started cutting at the base. If I make my cut at the base and then start pulling and yanking the thing out, then it's probably gonna snap off down the bottom. So I just make sure that it's pretty free up in the top. Thank you. And then we come down to the pleaching. So I've decided where I want to start. I start cutting on the opposite side to the direction I want the thing to lay, as you can see. And then I make the first blow. And then as I start to, to open that up, I can apply pressure to the stem, so pull it down. And I start to cut further in there, further down. Every time I open, I'm able to bend it over. I'm able to cut lower and lower and lower so that I get this diagonal cut, which takes me over to the opposite side where I just want that quarter inch or so remaining. I hope that description made sense, okay? So I've laid that over now, it's come down, but there's still some sorting out to do on that. There's branches sticking in all directions. So I do the same sort of laying cut or nicking on each of the little branches so as I can guide them down and place them in the hedge wherever I like. It's the same for every style of hedge laying. First we cut at the base and then we sort of sorted out as it were the top branches and we start to what we call build the hedge so we build the hedge according to the pattern of style that we're doing and, and this happened to be a midland style so i'm just nicking that next branch and putting that into position next is this one is um i'm sharpening the stakes so these stakes you remember the pictures there and the description of, of leaving live stakes we don't do that anymore because the downside of that is that you actually get growth from the top of those live posts, almost like a shaving brush really, which actually is not a particularly good idea. So we bring in uh, stakes as we call them. These are hazel, they could be ash. Um, what else could they be? They could possibly be birch. Uh, but I, I buy mine in from Hampshire, the, the famous coppice woods of Hampshire, and I bring them all the way up to where I am. They're not cheap these days, they're about a pound each for these things now, but I'm going to put them in, drive them in every so often along the along the hedge and that length is usually about from my elbow to the end of my fist which I think is the old cubit measurement I think so I'll sort of measure them and put them in as we go along and each style is different how we work those stakes in I'm just sharpening that one thank you 
um, this picture of my son here, hedge laying. What we do then when we've finished our hedge laying and we've got all our stakes in a nice straight line, we offer into it uh, what we call the binding or also known as the heathering or ethering. Um, these are hazel wands, maybe 12 feet longer. Again, I get mine from the Hampshire coppice woods. And these are bound along the top and that ties the whole thing together. It's knocked down very, very tight. Then the top of the stakes is taken off and that just makes it really, really strong. And in the days when there was no such thing as a barbed wire fence and these laid hedges were absolutely forming the stock proof barrier, then we didn't want cows to rub up against it or possibly lift it with their horns, etc. So they go, those go on really tight. Not every style uses binding, but those that do, they vary around the country as well in the method that we do it. OK. And uh, that's the south of England binding on a finished hedge there. Um, we start at one end, we offer a binder behind every stake and we work it in in that kind of weaving pattern along the top of the hedge. And that's a south of England style binding. The south of England is a style. It's called the south of England style. OK. And just a picture of, of how hedge laying, in a sense, is helping to keep the, the coppice woodworkers of various places. This is in Hampshire going. Uh, magnificent woods down in Hampshire near Stockbridge. Um, we go down there, I get all my binders and stakes from there. These guys are working these woods. It's so important for nature conservation. There's an yeah, absolute flush of flowers in that scene this following spring. And then they move on next year and they're making bean sticks, um, thatching spars, faggots of hazel for uh, shoring up riverbanks etc etc um, i so enjoy going down there and talking to these guys but that's where i get all my heathering from now technology uh, is going to come into play now because i think connor is going to suggest that we click on a link are you there connor and i want you to well i'm asking you to um watch a short video on the process of, of hedge laying so how are we going to you going to take over there Connor? so yes thank you very much, Nigel. Um, if you haven't seen it already, I will post it again. There's a link that I've just posted into the chat. We have had some technical difficulties, um, so we're not able to play the video ourselves. Um, I could click the link, but you, you would not really hear a great deal. So what we're hoping you can do is you can click that link. Um, you're all muted, so don't worry about your background um, noise. Uh, being heard, um, and you can watch the eight minute long um, YouTube video from Nigel. What and then I think uh, right and say, kind of when it's ended, we just just it, uh, go out of the YouTube and come back in. Yeah, yeah. Close your YouTube channel um, that will have opened from pressing the link and bring yourself back to YouTube. Don't worry, we'll give you ample time to see you again. Um, what I might do, um, I can play it, but I can play it only with subtitles. So what I'll do for those who aren't able to get the YouTube link to work is I, I'll play it myself, um, but with subtitles. Um, so hopefully we'll see you all again in, in eight minutes, so to speak. If you're having any trouble, drop a note into the chat and I'll see what I can do. And I do recommend trying to try the link first because there is, you know, me talking again, really, but it makes a bit more sense. <laughs>
Uh, don't worry if you didn't manage to get the link to work um, to watch the video or you didn't see the share that I had on the screen. Um, I understand some, had, some could see it, but see it quite jittery. Um, in the post email that we'll send to all participants, we will give you the link to this video, which you can find on YouTube. So I, I think, um, Nigel, um, good for me, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, are we heading to questions? No, we've got a little, little, little unless, more. unless we're short of time. No, I've still got plenty. Oh, great, great. Another four hours, yep. Back to the presentation. <laughs> <coughs> yes, please. Where, where yeah. have we left off? Great. <coughs> Yes, we'll go straight to the next slide if we may. <coughs> you can hear me okay, can you? Yep. Good, right. So I, I will I will crack on because there is a few to go. So excuse me, I do go on a bit. But uh, so let's look at these styles. So that's the, uh, the different styles that are around the country. So um, this is the Midland style hedge. And the, the immediate thing to notice about the Midland style hedge, which you probably might see around Shropshire a bit, is the two sides of it. Very clean at the front. Um, side there and all the brash is over the back side the back of the hedge we lay it off as we call it and um that is because in a field rotation the cattle or the stock would be in the field behind they'd come up against that wall of thorn and this side of the field this side would go in a field rotation into a crop of um, wheat or barley or whatever so that it protects the new growth the stock don't eat the new growth that's the midland style thank you I'll flash through these different styles. This is the Lancashire and Westmoreland style. It's what we call a double brush style. The Midland style is a single brush, as in the brush goes over one side. Um, and uh, this is a double brush from more sort of sheep country where there's no field rotations. The sheep are, or cat animals are both sides. That's a Lancashire and Westmoreland style, okay? Devon hedges, now they're unique in the fact that they have this massive great big um, bank this bulk of, of earth which must have taken centuries to build they grow the hedge on top of that those banks and they grow it and sort of lay it or they call it they use the word steeping they steep the hedge along the comb the crown of one side and then there's a, a sort of place you can literally walk up the middle of the bank and then they steep the other comb there exactly the same cutting technique it's just pegged down with crooks rather like sort of tent pegs really that's the devon style okay And that just shows an, a, a really extreme, if you wish, uh, a picture of the Devon style on these massive, great big banks. Um, I wonder if I could ask a favor of the gentleman that's doing the exercises there. It's a bit distracting. Would you mind awfully? Thank you so much. There we go. I'm just catching my eye there. You must be as fit as a fiddle, I should think. Um, anyway, um, so this is a really massive Devon bank and you can see how they lay along the front comb and then the back comb of that. And you literally could walk along the, the, the middle there. Thank you. Um, this is unusual in a sense. This is the Yorkshire style, where it's the only style that has this um, plank. Uh, they literally, or rail, uh, along the top of it. Very, very narrow hedge from the arable areas of Yorkshire. Same cutting, if you notice, as, as before, okay? And um, this is a Dorset style, very close up. They have quite low banks in Dorset, and they, they do this quite low form of hedge length. Same cutting. That's Dorset style. And there's another picture coming up next, please. You can see how wide that is. It's you know it's less than sort of three foot high, <coughs> but the width would stop anything getting through that. Really solid, and they have long wands of hazel. If you can see my cursor at the front, the foreground, they bend over rods of hazel which hold it down and sort of stick it between the branches. Thank you. This is a South of England style from the south east of, uh, uh, of England, really Kent, Sussex, etc. It's a double brush style with the stakes down the middle. This is at a, at a competition. That's one of my sections, I believe. Okay. This is a Welsh style, Welsh style, which you, you may well see quite a lot of, lot of up on the borders there. Uh, there are many Welsh styles, too many for me to remember. 
uh, Brecon, Montgomery, Glamorgan, on it goes. But th this is a Welsh border style. And the, the difference is that they put the stakes in at, at a diagonal angle. And now I think I'm right in saying there is a Shropshire style. I, I can't, couldn't find a picture of it, but where they also put the stakes in at an angle. And they and here in Wales, they they, they do put a lot of dead wood in. It's it's from sheep country and they're, they're trying to stop the sheep getting their noses in on any new regrowth. That's the Welsh style or one of the Welsh styles. OK. And this is uh, out of interest, it's something I developed. I call this conservation hedge laying, uh, just to, to save landowners a bit of money. Uh, it doesn't require stakes and binders at all um, and uh, can sort of half the price. Cutting is still exactly the same, but we call it, it's ideal between two fences. Because let's face it, you know, um, the fences being the stock proof barrier there. So still quite neat and a wonderful wildlife habitat. And, and whilst I'm on that point, it's just worth explaining really why do we lay hedges these days if we've got wire fences? Um, well, because it produces such a wonderful wildlife habitat and we're rejuvenating new growth from the base of the hedge. OK, thank you. And uh, one of the things which I, I really enjoy doing, um, this is on um, Prince of Wales estate in Gloucestershire. We just finished laying this. This hedge was a really tall hedge, about 25 years old, and those it was the hedge was about as tall as those trees. But as we're going along there, uh, we have the opportunity to reveal these trees which have gone up with the with the hedge, and uh, you have like an instant wonderful oak tree in that in that laid hedge. It's really quite satisfying. Okay. Now this is a, qu a quick little thing. I mentioned the Prince of Wales. Prince of Wales' hobby is hedge laying, and he's the patron of the National Hedge Laying Society. And how did he first come across hedge laying? Well. Uh, a gentleman called John Savings in Oxford, she used to go around a lot of the agricultural shows with this mini display of bonsai laid hedges, all in different styles. And he was quite captivated by this at one of the old royal shows and um, literally took up uh, hedge laying. And, and, and for the Hedge Laying Society, it's been absolutely marvellous having him as patron. Um, uh, and but all due to these little miniature bonsai hedges. Thank you. And that, there's him. He, we have a small competition every year on one of his uh, parcels of land is just <laughs> having a chat with my son he goes around and meets you know but it's great for the youngsters to have the opportunity to go along and uh, meet the patron of the hedge laying society thank you and national hedge laying society is a great uh, their their website is a great source of information we have national championship every year it was in uh, hampshire this year in october next year i believe it's going to be possible in Gloucestershire um, and we each get 10 meters there's over 100 hedge layers so there's a lot of hedge and we have to produce the best work in five hours over this um, uh, 10 meters and there are classes for each style and an overall supreme champion thank you and um, there's a few of the cups up for grabs everything from novice to intermediate to veteran to best regrowth best stake and bound hedge even a prize called best work on a poor length because sometimes you know you draw a number and you not get a very good hedge so they take that into consideration for the person that does the best work on on that thank you and here's a, a gentleman called malcolm johnson who's won the supreme championship more more times than i care to remember probably about eight and that's his midland winning hedge that particular year behind him thank you um, hedge laying is actually spreading here, there and everywhere, really. This uh, we go over to this event in the Netherlands each year um, where they develop their own sort of style over there. But we go and do a demonstration, the National Hedge Laying Society. Absolutely thousands of visitors. This is just a little agricultural display thing walking around. But uh, you get about 6000 people who all turn turn up on bicycles, which is a it is a diff very different looking car park when you have 6000 bicycles parked. Thank you. And this was something I did a couple of years ago. As far as we know, this was the first ever hedge laying competition in America. This was in up in New York State. They, they were interested and, and asked me to go over there. And they've even formed a North American hedge laying society now. Not that there's that many hedges, I have to say, but they're working on that. And uh, there, were, there did used to be hedges. We can see from it from historic uh, books uh, that there were lots of um, hedges in the on the East Coast. Thank you. So let, I want to sort of bring things round really to uh, slightly away from hedge laying, just on the importance of hedgerows. You know, hedgerows are 
we can't hold a hedge at any given stage of its life cycle. It has to be allowed to develop and then we rejuvenate it. And hedge laying is one of those rejuvenation practices. So we might all agree that this is a really nice hedge. It's wild and woolly. It's got a few hedgerow trees in it. But unfortunately, a lot of hedges look like the next slide. Trimmed at the same height probably since the 1950s. This is a, 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 an old hawthorn hedge. We can see just down in there where it was last laid, God knows when. But repetitive cutting, especially on pure hawthorn hedges, to the same height forms these horrible mushroom shaped sort of things that the, the stems become gnarled and rotting at the base. And really that kind of hedge has pretty well had it. You could just about let that go up. It's got enough stems to let it go up and lay it. But we have to move away from this excessive trimming at the same height in, in my view. Thank you. And here's another one which has had it from all directions. It's being trimmed on top and it's had sheep grazing underneath. And the future of that hedge is, um, is not good at all. You probably have to grub it out or something. Thank you. So I don't want to talk about the whole hedge and management life cycle. But what's going on when we trim hedges to that height is it's like putting a, a box around it, one of these steel gabion boxes. And we cut everything off as soon as it comes out. And you can imagine that over time that will start to to degrade the stems get bigger it gets gnarled and twisted and but kind of that's what we're doing if we cut a hedge at the same height forever thank you the other extreme to over trimming is neglect so if someone walks away from a hedge this hedge is a hawthorn hedge again it's way over 100 years old and it's starting to collapse that's the you know a hawthorn tree only lasts about 120 130 years maybe and there's been no rejuvenation and that's the other poor thing that's happening so over management sends it one way where it just fades away and neglect means that it will just eventually become a line of trees or fall down thank you and uh, somewhere in the middle of those two extremes is a healthy hedge you might be able to see with my, where my cursor is moving a sort of a shadow across the middle of there that's where it was being cut for many 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 years but the landowner has decided to let that grow up there are lots of stems in it that's ideal for a rejuvenation it could be cut to ground level, something we call coppicing, but it's that's ideal for hedge laying. Thank you. Not all hedges can be laid. Either it's too expensive or it's just not feasible, the stems are too large or, or whatever reason. So we coppice a hedge. That, that means cutting it down to ground level and allowing those stumps to regrow, which they will do. Nearly all species apart from evergreens will regrow from the base. It is a bit of a shock to the system, you know, it, is, it exposes one's land, as it were, but it is a perfectly viable means of rejuvenation. It's just that we're perhaps not as used to it as they, they are on Europe. Um, so some people can get a bit upset by it. Thank you. We have to rejuvenate hedges periodically. And here you see this is a couple of months. This is probably in April following the coppicing and those buds are still are starting to shoot on this old stump. And it gives us the opportunity to plant up the gaps in a very gappy hedge so that it really thickens up that hedge and starts a new life. It's rejuvenation. Thank you. And hedge laying is part of that rejuvenation. And it also provides this wonderful corridor through which um, wildlife can travel. Um, a host of birds love to nest in these kind of hedges. Yellow hammers is an absolute classic. But how do we look after a hedge after we've laid it? Well, I would suggest, having just said that we shouldn't trim very hard forever, but I would suggest in the first years following hedge laying, maybe the first six to eight years, we do actually trim it quite tightly because it kind of trains the hedge. Every time we trim it, it thickens out, it throws new shoots, and it forms this dense hedge, which is what we've, what we've, um, what we want. If you lay a hedge and you spent all that money and all that effort, don't just let it grow straight back up again. Um, historically, they say they used to lay hedges every fifteen years, but we can't afford that these days. We need to make a hedge last as long as possible by slowly allowing it to develop over the years. Okay. And uh, sometimes after I've laid a hedge, I trim it with one of these um, hedge trimmers, these long handled hedge trimmers. And that's a two years after laying. And I've lent that against that hedge just to show that nice A shape that I've created along there, which then I can hand that over to a tractor mounted flail. And he, if he keeps that hedge, uh, sorry, that A shape going, that's the best shape for a trimmed hedge, but not to smash it down, just to back off incrementally every single time. Okay. And, uh, you know, the, the flail machine is a great asset to hundreds of thousands of miles of hedges, and that's how we look after them. Um, 
but we have to be careful that we don't over trim things with the flail, okay? Or we get that. You know, honestly, if we trim a hedge at the same height for over 50, 60 years, which many of them are, that's how I call them ghost hedges. They, they've kind of had it. There's going to be nothing there in the end. So you need to back off and allow the hedge to develop, okay? And you could, you know, let a hedge develop into something like that. It's still trimmed, but it's nicely trimmed. And so in, if you were stood near the flail machine, you wouldn't be hearing this crashing sort of <coughs> sort of noise. You'd be hearing this <coughs> as the hedge trimmer went along there. And that's a lovely hedge. You know, it can breathe, if you will. Thank you. And by not trimming every year or by not trimming um, not quite so hard, you do get blossom forming. If you trim a hedge hard every year, you don't get any blossom forming, therefore you don't get any berries. Um, and so, you know, blossom is an incredibly important thing. It's what the insects feed on, you know. Okay, next slide. And uh, from the blossom, we get berries set. And of course, we get lots of different berries in hedgerows. And we can see now, certainly around me, flocks and flocks of field fairs and red wings feeding on the rich crop of berries at this time of the year. Okay. And there are the field fairs and red wings. Thank you. Planting hedges. There's a call by the government to plant 220,000 kilometers of hedge up until 2050, which is brilliant. But how do we look after hedges after we've planted them? And unfortunately, if we start trimming at that magic height, that same height, they don't form any base. There's no shelter in that hedge. If you're a bird, you wouldn't probably nest in that hedge. So how do we manage these new hedges? Thank you. Well, one of the ways, and we've seen this slide before, is that you just let them grow up, straight up. And then after 20 or so years, and it is usually between about 18 and 25 years, that they're ready for hedge laying. And if you planted trees in the hedge, then those trees will be mature and they'll stand alone. Hedge laying is a fantastic end product to planting hedges, much more so than trimming them at that set height forever, okay? And the last slide you'll be glad to know is just a general picture of somewhere in Britain, the British patchwork quilt of hedgerows. And I believe really, really strongly that although they we perceive them to be the, the simple thing, the hedgerow out there, they are absolutely vital for us and will become even more so when we start to require you know, more carbon being stored, more habitat for wildlife. Um, and after all, that's our culture. That is our landscape. And thank you very, very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Nigel. That was such an interesting and wonderful talk. Probably gone right over time. My apologies. No, absolutely. I'm sure we've, we've kept everybody. So I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised everybody wants to stick around and, and hear more. And I'm sure we could take up, you know, as you say, another four hours worth of talking. <laughs> but uh, here we are. So what I think we'll do now, if you're happy, is we'll go to some questions. Yeah. Um, and what we did at the last session is I, uh, I essentially called out the, the persons whose questions I, I can see listed in the chat, uh, ask them if they want to, you know, ask their question to you verbally um, or, or elaborate on their questions. So, um, Boyd. Hi, Nigel. Um, I'm, uh, uh, as, as I said at the start, introduction, I'm Boyd McCleary, I'm Chair of CPRE Hampshire. Um, we have been involved in the CPRE Hedgerow Heroes project the last year, and one of the things we've been uh, exploring and doing is, is hedge laying. And we found a, a local hedge layer who's um, provided courses for uh, a number of volunteers, and it's gone really well, and we'd like to do the same again next year. We also thought we'd like to set up a traineeship or an apprenticeship and um, uh, hopefully get some funding for that from one of our um, local trusts. Um, We'd like to accredit that in some way. And I was wondering if you had any advice as to how we might do that. I gather there may be some sort of accreditation scheme through the National Hedgelang Society, yes, or possibly indeed. through the Southern, um, um, South of England Hedgelang Society. I wonder if you could offer some advice as to how best to proceed in that. Yes, well, it sounds wonderful if you're gonna start doing those kind of almost apprenticeships. Um, the Hedgelang Society has just formed a partnership with the Drystone Walling Association to uh, set about um, large scale training and offer work to apprentices throughout the sort of field boundaries world, shall I say. And the Hedge Lang Society with help from the Prince's Trust has set up an accreditation scheme, which anyone can apply to. And it goes from, you know, uh, courses where you just get a certificate of attendance through to a bronze, bronze level, a silver level, and then a gold sort of almost like a master craftsman um, 
standard, and that is being supported and monitored, shall I say, by Lantra, a very well-established training organisation. So it's literally starting um, this winter and onwards. We launched it at our national championship in October, and uh, we encourage people to apply to go through. You know, we, we'd like to push people up through these standards. If you're a master craftsman, then you might want to apply for that um, gold standard and then and then use it to sell your wares as it as it were um so yes indeed uh I totally encourage you to do that and uh, we look forward to seeing people being accredited by the national hedgelang society should we then should i just contact the national hedgelang society directly now is that the best way to proceed yeah absolutely so yes once you've got people online shall i say to be accredited then yes yeah absolutely thank you very much now i'll ask paul garrett paul if you're still with us hello yes can you hear me yes yeah hi um i'm very much an amateur to this um but very interested in hedge laying um and i was just interested in seeing when i've seen hedges laid in Shropshire, sometimes i've seen them like in the um very early sort of spring time um i think it's early spring or late autumn and it's just asking when's the best time to do it because i noticed a lot of foliage on these um on some of these pictures and yep. it must make it quite awkward sometimes when you get a lot of leaves and greens to see what you're doing oh um well let me tell you for a start when one is allowed to do hedge lane really so that's after september the first and before march the first that's because of the protection of nesting birds um, and if you were to do it outside those uh, times, you'd have to do a pretty uh, thorough survey to be absolutely confident that nothing was nesting in those hedges, uh, otherwise you'd be liable. But um, we do start hedge laying in September, um, and the leaves are still on then. Uh, lots of competitions in September, that's because they're often combined with ploughing competitions, for example. Um, and it makes a nice finish laid hedge, actually. It's quite pleasurable in a way, having leaf on it at the end. You know, you can see, you can trim it up nicely. Um, so no, they're not a hindrance, having the leaf on at all, to be honest with you. And it's, it's, it's a short season anyway. And when you start laying hedges, you know, getting paid, you need to be starting quite early to fit in your full order book that hopefully you might have one day. Yep. OK, thank you for that. That's, that's, that's good, good information. Thank you. We have uh, Peter Flynn here who's asking for some guidance. I'll, I'll read Peter's um, question out. Um, well, he first starts by stating that the Prince of Wales got him into um, got him into hedge laying when he worked for him. Ah. Um, so his question is, he is uh, a, a southerly neighbour of yours, Nigel, uh, in Herefordshire. He assume, uh, I assume the borders style runs down through both shires and into Wales a fair bit. It seems to be a bit of a blend of Wales and Midlands styles with a bit of dead wood going in where required. Yeah, I'd like to lay in a style appropriate for Herefordshire. So do you have any guidance for, for him? Gosh, well, I'm, I'm not from Herefordshire, but I do agree with the first part of the question that, that it seems to be quite Welsh in what they do there, that Welsh border kind of style. But you might find more eastern parts of Herefordshire, which is is using the Midland style, perhaps. Um, you know, I think you're on a, a crossover sort of area there, really. So I, I think probably the thing to do is to see what's being done if you see it around or talk to local hedge layers. There's probably a hedge laying uh, competition uh, up there at some stage. There's, there's a Welsh society as well. Um, you're right on the, the merging of two styles there, I think. So I, I think you've described it very well. It's Welsh or Midland, and it's whichever you prefer, really, and, and not so slightly dependent on what kind of hedges you're laying. So I think if you've got mixed species hedges on a bank, for example, that might lend itself more to one of the, the Welsh border styles. Thank you. Um, I think we'll go to Nicola. Nicola Stone. Hello, that was brilliant. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, it's uh, it's really interesting. I was wondering when you go to a site, do you um, you kind of recommend a certain style for um, the key purpose that the landowner is looking for, or are the styles in each kind of area that way because of climate and certain species in the hedgerows? No, not because of those two last reasons you gave. Yeah. I, th I think styles develop through mostly the availability of materials, uh, 
a quick example, the Derbyshire style, for example, there's not a lot of hazel coppice, so hazel available for the binding. So mm -hmm. they don't use a binding, for example, th things yeah. like that. It depends on the agricultural practice, whether it's, as I mentioned, the Midland style was part of this four year rotation. So there was a clean side and a brush side. The double brush styles have stopped perhaps both sides. To be crushingly blunt, I think probably that stop proof need is not so prevalent these days. I do wonder sometimes if our livestock, our stocking rates are too heavy almost these days, you know. Um, so often, to be honest, those laid hedges are going to be sometimes protected by a fence anyway. Mm -hmm. So I know this grant schemes re require you, ask you to do it in a local you know the vernacular style okay. of your area and you you'd quite easily find out what that was i think to mm -hmm. be honest with you does that answer your question yeah yeah. yeah no brilliant yeah. thank you okay we'll go to harriet fleming hello hi oh, harriet hello. hi <laughs> say goodbye to the guests course. first hello um i i'm getting a hedge from the woodland trust and yep. i'm sure it's got spiky things in it you know like rose dog rose and stuff like that right that be right could be yeah yeah so if, yeah so if i put loads of spiky stuff in it then wait 18 years to lay it isn't that going to get in the way of laying it because it'll no be spiky. It, i mean if, if you are specific, specifically talking about dog rose by the spiky things i mean there's lots of spiky things in hedges that could be hawthorn blackthorn all sorts but i think you're just talking about dog rose and there wouldn't be that much of it typically in a hedge mix dog rose would be possibly two percent or something to be honest with you um but no then they're, 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 they're not pleasant to deal with but it wouldn't stop you hedge laying at, at all um it, you know it's worth noting when we plant hedges these days uh we do plant mixed species hedges because we recognize the importance of the different blossoms and the different berries of course in the midlands they only used to plant during the time of the enclosures it would be pure hawthorn um, but but yeah. we, I think we've all seen the light a bit on that, really. OK, thank you. So don't worry about the spiky things. <laughs> OK. We've got um, Martin Redford has uh, got a very uh, keen eye. He's uh, noticed the implements behind you, Nigel, and he's asking whether you're doing practical courses on scything. <laughs> yeah, that's that's summer work. That seems a long way away. Yes, I do do scything courses and uh, I, I create wildflower meadows for people and, and love scything um, and uh, been often go to Romania to Transylvania to help some farmer friends of ours and uh, even entered the European Scything Championships once, which, um, which is a bit embarrassing. But um, no, I love scything. Yeah. And yes, we do courses. There is a Scything Association. If you if you look, look that up, you'll find a Scything website, believe it or not. And it doesn't mention polled up once. <laughs> um, Adrian S. Adrian S. I'm not sure if we're still here. Yes, hello. Hello. Um, hi, Adrian. Yes, hi. I was, I was wondering if you've picked up uh, how people are uh, recording hedges with a view to restoring them. I'm in the uh, CPRE's Hedgerow Heroes project in Suffolk Essex borders, and we've used the Survey One Two Three app. But what do other people do? Have you come across that much? Uh, I don't know that particular app, uh, uh, One Two Three, you say it's called. But what I did develop myself was something we call the life cycle scale, which you can find on the Hedgelink page, and that's a one to ten scale. And PTES, that's the People's Trust for Endangered Species, you can use that in their hedge survey booklet. We adapted it for that. And it's a very, very good way of looking at a hedge, particularly in winter, and putting it into this one to 10 scale. And very quickly, I show you, showed you pictures of those ruined old hedges. They'd be a number one. And then a line of trees would be number 10. And uh, we need to try and keep our hedges somewhere in the middle there. But that's a very useful uh, way of surveying hedges. If you look at the PTES website, there's a whole pack on community hedge surveys and we've just done one i've helped do one in my local town and it's been absolutely fantastic you've got everybody involved we've just been planting hedges as well this last weekend and it's been a complete success i must say thanks very much that is that we uh, from hampshire here we, we were also hedgerow heroes and um we had pts come down and uh, do a course for our volunteers and they were fantastic lady called megan yes indeed um, yeah and we have fed all the information back to pts who are collating it and we can yeah. use that then as a base for, for our future work in the area. Yeah. 
And the reason I developed this one to 10 scale was that I could clearly see that we've almost forgotten the art of looking at a hedge and reading what's going on in it, if you see what I mean. And it's a very simple way that, that just focuses in people. So three downwards is really bad. They're going downhill because it's over trimmed and sort of nine, eight, nine upwards, they're going upwards because they've been neglected. So it, have a look. It, it's a useful tool. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question here from Julia, which I'll read out. Bramble is great for wildlife, but not in a hedge. We have some very old trim hedges in Leicestershire, which have some dead elm, and then bramble has come in. How best to deal with these and then stop the bramble taking over if we gap up? We have had most of the hedges on our 300 acre farm laid by David Smith some 10, 20 years okay. ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we haven't tackled the two where this is a problem. No. Okay, so how can I... It's quite a complex it answer. The, it says that all of their hedges are pre-enclosed and mixed species. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Yeah, and they would be having, you know, when, when, when elms in a hedge, clearly we know from that that there would, be, would have been big mature elms there or thereabouts in the past, and those elm suckers are, are, are hanging on, so they probably are old hedges. So here's the thing with bramble. Yes, it is important in this sense for wildlife, both the berries and the blossom. But yes, it also can swamp a hedge and be a pain. I would point out that sometimes when hedges get into a bad state, it's, it's the bramble that's in them that is the only thing giving it any shelter or uh, any form of, um, what's the word, nutrition for, for the insects and the birds in the hedge. So sometimes it can be almost a, you know, if that wasn't there, it really would be an empty hedge, if you see what I mean. If you really do want to plant it up again, then yes, those those brambles are going to smother anything that you put in. So it's a difficult one to crawl, to be kind. You've got to coppice the whole hedge probably and possibly get in like a mini digger and actually pull out those bramble roots. You'll never utterly get rid of them, but you can get, a, you know, get the most of them away and then they won't swamp those new plants. So good and bad bramble, great for wildlife, bit of a pain when it, swamps a hedge but sometimes it is the only shelter in a hedge um so so good luck and if david's laying your hedges i know they'll be good thank you very much for the question julian thank you for the answer Nigel. um i think i'll ask because he's patiently held his electronic yellow hand up for quite a while david booker yes thank you uh, and thank you nigel for a wonderful talk i attended a two-day workshop uh, run by CPRE recently in Hedgelane. Um, and so I'm very much a beginner. Yep. And I started on my own head. And I've met every problem I couldn't answer <laughs> so far. Uh, one of the problems has been that the hedge has been pleached in the past, but left to run riot. So there's an awful lot of rot and dead wood at the base. I guess because there's not much light coming into the hedge. Would that be right? Yes, I, I think I can imagine what you mean. Has it, so it's tall hedge or been over trimmed now at any stage? No, it was pleached a long time ago and yeah. flayed within an inch of its life. Oh, there's there's the narrative you see. That's the thing. So so if you think back once upon a time, that hedge must have been really quite tall, 12, 15 foot high. It must have been ideal for laying. They laid it. There must have been loads of stems. So they wanted to make a stock proof barrier. And then they started trimming it, which was the right thing to do in the early years. But what's happened is they've trimmed it now for the next 50 years. So that has gone through its life cycle. The, the, the stems are starting to get bigger and bigger. Or the, yeah, it's, the stems are getting bigger and bigger. They can't go anywhere. They're in that box. You remember that diagram? Effectively, yeah. they're in that box. They're becoming gnarled and twisted. Rot starts to set in. And even the option to stop and say, right, let's let it grow up to 12 foot and lay it. Sometimes that can be a problem because it's so rotten at the base. Yeah. The most important thing in a hedge is have you got a lot of stems? And when you've got a lot of stems, you've got options. You can either coppice it or you can let it grow up and lay it. But if you really can see that they are gnarled and rotten, because it sounds like you know that if you if you cut one and it's gnarled and rotten, that will just break off, won't it? Yeah. Absolutely. And if it's got to that stage, then the cruel to be kind thing to do is to cut it all off the ground level. Let it regrow. You may need to protect to protect it in some way from deer or whatever. And then in 12, 15 years, you, you might be able to have much more pleasure in laying a young hedge. Yeah. yeah. So, Thank I mean, you. that's the brutal truth. They sh never should have got like that. Yeah. The one uh, Occasionally, you do get a pleat section that's remained intact uh, and it's quite long um, and runs horizontal. 
yeah. uh, for quite a length. Yeah. And, but it's grown into a thickness about eight to nine inches. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because it's just raised off the ground. Would I be able to pleat that so it rests down on the ground? Or is so that too thick? Has, has it got vertical shoots along it going upwards? Yeah. So what we often do with that is we go back to the original pleat, the original cut, and very delicately as we move along the hedge, we just gently recut that and drop it right down onto ground so it sits firmly on the ground. And then you can individually do the verticals over. You see what I mean? Yes, I do. And then that makes that that allows the trunk then to sit back on the ground comfortably without any 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 failure in in the regrowth no, as long as you've been gentle with the cut it will sit down on the ground and allow you to pleach over the verticals to thicken up your hedge perfectly fine lovely thank you thank Be you very, very careful when you do it yes yeah <laughs> alex hi yes um a oh, wonderful talk i've really really enjoyed this um, thank you alex. Just, just on a practical sense um kind of minimum not minimum PPE. Obviously, I have my chainsaw gear and and everything. But um, all the hedges I see, unfortunately, aren't as pretty as yours. And um, you know, full of wonderful um, hawthorn and blackthorn and everything that wants to spike me and eat me. So do you use, you know, kind of do you wrap leather around your arms? Um, any any little hints or tips? Or is it just a matter of being very careful? I mean, your hedges all look very, you know, fairly. Not not easy. The photographs we had, but um, you should see some of the jumble stuff that <laughs> I, I might be uh, attacking. Yeah. And um, how to read a hedge is obviously something I know nothing about. But yeah. um, you know, um, but kind of minimum kind of um, requirements. So I don't you know end yeah. up shredding my arms and. Well, I think chainsaw trousers. Well, are you using the chainsaw? Yes. Yeah. So I mean, you you naturally always want to have the full protection for yeah, that. I'm, I'm the... fully qualified in my chainsaws. I've got my chainsaw yeah. kit. Yeah. But, but one of the great things, even if you weren't using the chainsaw, there's two parts of that kit that are really useful. One is the chainsaw trousers because they are quite thorn proof, to be honest, yeah. with the better quality ones. And then you can really get in and push against the head, which is the legs. And the other thing, I've been poked in the eye numerous times. I don't like wearing goggles. They just don't, they annoy me. So I always wear my cha chainsaw helmet, helmet. Even if I'm not using a chainsaw, I always wear, wear my chainsaw helmet with the visor down. And I feel kind of naked without it these days, to be honest. But it's interesting. When I first started out going to hedge lane competitions, at, I don't know, 18, 19, 20, I used to come home and my my arms would look like I've been tortured. I mean, there would be blood and scratches everywhere. Yeah, that's what I'm expecting. If I, if I was going out to dinner that night, everybody would look at my arms and think I'd been tortured. But the funny thing is, the more experience you get, I've been hedge laying all winter. I, I, I don't get scratched. I always wear a long gauntlet on my left hand. I'm right. I'm right-handed yep. working with tools, right? I wear a, a gauntlet on my left hand, which is grabbing the thorn, etc. I don't wear one on my right hand because you get better contact with the tool without a glove. I would encourage you to not wear a glove on the, the hand you're holding the tool, be that left or right yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And but always wear your left hand there. You wear your chainsaw helmet, even if you're not using a chainsaw with the visor down, um, and uh, you, you'll, you'll be all right. No, brilliant. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, we'll go to Martin Redfern. Hi, uh, thanks for an excellent talk. Um, Thank see you. if I can unmute my video as well. Yeah, there we go. Hi, um, we've got, hi, um, we've got a length of very thick, fairly old neglected hedge uh, which has got a lot of sheep netting and barbed wire grown into it. Um, uh, it's quite thick at the bottom um, and plenty up above it. Could I pleach it above all the wire or do I have to either strip the wire out or risk blunting all my tools on it? <laughs> no, absolutely. You can't pleach it at that height. You know, the whole point of hedge laying is that you do it close to the ground to get that new growth from close to the ground, thicken up the base, and then you start that life cycle again. Um, I'm guessing that the hedge has just grown through the wire. The actual planted hedge stems are, the, the, the wire doesn't go down the middle of them. It's just grown through the wire at the side, has it, I imagine? Uh, well, some, some of the thicker trunks have actually incorporated bits of wire. Oh, that's not nice. Um, if you think you can, and it's going to be a tricky job, get that wire out and not leave, you know, don't go and use a chainsaw and then you're going to hit the wire in the, in the, in the stem if it's grown in. That's really nasty, that is. Um, to be blunt, if that's 
if it's that bad and you can't genuinely get all the wire out to lay the hedge, the only thing you can do is to cut the hedge down to ground level. And that sounds incredibly harsh, but then you need to put a new fence up away from it slightly. I imagine over the years, they've just patched up holes and they often staple it to the hawthorn stem and, you know, it's so short-sighted and you're left with the problem. There's no easy answer, really, unless you can get that wire out and lay, lay, lay the hedge and know that there's not any metal inside it. You've got a problem there, I'm afraid. I can't cheer you up know. any more than that, really. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds nasty. Thanks. <laughs> we'll take two more questions. Um, Francis. Yes, thank you, uh, Nigel. And, and, and thank you to CPRE Shropshire because I've, I've had uh, a line of uh, a hedge nicely made by your uh, courses um, over the last uh, couple of months and I think uh, uh, next year as well. So um, my, my question is really about um, trimming uh, and uh, yeah, fully understand the, the sort of ideal A-frame uh, approach. But um, there's a temptation among, amongst farmers uh, everywhere, I suspect, just to sort of tidy things up at the end of harvest, uh, get all the uh, hedge trimmed, uh, nicely um, uh, box-shaped, if you like, um, yeah. which is right against what, 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 what we should be doing in order to encourage um, uh, wildlife diversity and, and so on. And, but, but where the land is damp, of course, that's, that's challenging unless you're going to go and, and try and persuade people to, to use brushing hooks and, uh, and, and strimmers and so on. So I don't know what, whether you have a, an answer to that, but that's, yeah. that's some of the problems we have here. Sure. No, well, I do my best in a way, and I might start off by giving you a pretty nasty statistic, really. In the last Countryside Survey, which was in 2007, it's a survey which looks at everything in the countryside and it's supposed to happen every 10 years, but the last was 2007. They found that overall across the country, hedgerows, 50% uh, of hedgerows were in what they call favourable condition against a set of criteria. But I hate to say this, and I don't want to offend anybody, but when they looked at just arable areas, they found that only 12% of hedgerows were in favourable condition. And I'm not quite sure why that is. Maybe people are worried about the shade, so they cut them down, but they, or, or it's the mentality of neatness. But, you know, I understand the thing about wet wetland. I, I really do. When we did a whole lot of research uh, on trimming uh, with Hedgelink, and you can find the paper on that on there, um, and we tried... Um, oh, it's a long story to tell you what we did, but we cut it on various regimes along the same... We cut, divided a hedge into 30 metre sections and either trimmed it annually or two years or three years hard down in September and late winter and um, we did find it hard sometimes to do the late winter ones because the land was so wet I understand that but the compromise to me is what I call incremental trimming and that is not cutting down to exactly the same height if you cut to the same height you get this knuckle forms you can see this con contorted growth around the cut height and we've been stuck on this height for decades now so by backing out even the worst hedges, you can almost sense them relaxing and like, ah, oh, freedom kind of thing. But if you, we know that if you cut every year hard, you don't get any berries of blossom. And you do, if you cut every three years, you get you get some in, in the third year, as it were. But if you cut incrementally, just back off slightly, you do get quite a few berries behind the cut line. To get berries, you need two or three year old wood for them to form on. So if you come out a little bit, and allow the hedge to breathe, you'll get some berries all over the hedge every year. OK, you won't get a boom year every three years, which is like the three year trimming regime. But really, I would encourage people if you've got to cut in um, post harvest, September, whatever, don't smash it so hard. Come, just come out a little bit, incrementally allowing the, the hedge to breathe and go through its life cycle. Now, the big question then people say is, well, that's all very well incremental trimming, but after about 40 years, my hedge is going to be really tall. Yes, it will. But you'll have really healthy stems along your hedgerow. So instead of them being battered into these gnarled and rotting ones, you'll have he a healthy hedge. And yes, you have to rejuvenate it either by laying or by coppicing. But every hedge, I believe, once in someone's lifetime, if you're a farmer, you as a farmer, that hedge, hedge number, what's it over there? has got to be rejuvenated once every, I'm not going to put a date on it, but 40, 50 years. Our job is to slow down the, the development of this hedge, but not to utterly try and hold it in that box. So incremental trimming to me is the way forward. And I, it's an idea of my own. I take a little bit of credit for it. And I think it's going to be in the new Elm scheme. So that's quite optimistic. Great. No, fantastic. Thanks for that. Thank you. And lastly, but certainly not least at all, Martin Steer. Hello. 
Um, thank you very much. Absolutely fantastic uh, evening, as always, as as all the hedge laying uh, talks have been. Um, I saw a thing uh, on a coppicing Facebook page whereby they cut hazel stools and then um, bent them down to the ground. And where they touched the ground, they um, were, were pinned down with another bit of hazel and they took root. Do you think that would work in a hedge if you were trying to, to, to gap it up at all? Yes, to a degree of wood. They, they actually oh, got a bit of noise pollution going on there. Um, they actually call that layering, not laying. When they do it with hazel, they call it layering. And that's how they would um, um, populate a wood. You know, they have to keep hazel in a coppice wood at a certain density so it grows straight up. And if you've got a bit of a gap, you do this layering where you peg it down, just as you say, and that kind of takes root. Um, it's hard to do with species, um, harder to do with species such as hawthorn, and especially hawthorn that's on, on the flat, shall I say. Uh, they do it a lot in Devon because in Devon they lay very, very flat along the back, or they call it steeping. They steep it along the flat and they peg it in with crooks. And often that is in contact with the, uh, the ground, is it there? Because it's running flat. And, oft and very often they, that's the way they fill up gaps. They make it root. It's harder with the more upright hedge laying styles, you know, the sort of 40 degree things, the Midland style, the South of England, all those, to do that, to, to drop it down and do that. But it, it's a perfectly valid way in, a, in, in um, coppicing scenario and on Devon banks. I've never seen it done with our Midland style hedging, you know, because they simply don't go down and touch the ground. Thank you very much. I saw, I saw it done with Elm in, in Devon. That's why I asked. There you go. Uh, There's 40, 40 years ago. But yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, Nigel. What an interesting and very educational talk. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, your time and your energy. We really, really enjoyed having you. And thank, thank you. you to all of our participants, um, I know everybody's mooted right now, but just imagine, Nigel, that there's a round of applause. No doubt, we've never been able to keep so many people for so long, actually. So oh, there no, you go. We no, have. Sure, right, there no, we go. They've all found a button somewhere. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you very much, all. Don't worry if you missed the first part of the talk. I know some people were joining us uh, slightly late. Um, it is recorded. It will be available on our website. Um, hopefully, first thing tomorrow. Um, you've been fantastic, Nigel. All of our participants have been fantastic. We are CPRE, the Countryside Charity. Good night and have a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, everybody. Bye-bye Thank now. you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.